On today's episode of Film Talk with Jordan Ramirez, my film review is Mulholland Drive, followed by my segment, Allow Me to Explain, and it all starts right now. This is Jordan Ramirez, and you are listening to Film Talk with Jordan Ramirez. Before I start my show, I want to remind my listeners that my birthday is coming up this Saturday. So, I am very happy that I am hosting this podcast as well as sharing some of the movies that I hope to broaden your horizons. While blending with my film reviews, I also thought I would delight my listeners with some commentary on different topics that I felt that I wanted to share and enlighten as a new interest to get my listeners to be paying attention to these certain topics. But that was what I was hoping to accomplish with this podcast. And now, here is my latest film review. My film review for this episode is Mulholland Drive, released in 2001, directed by David Lynch, starring Naomi Watts and Laura Haring. The synopsis of this film goes like this. Betty, played by Naomi Watts, arrives in Hollywood as a wannabe actress hoping to make it into the movies. After arriving at the airport with her friend Irene, played by Jean Bates, and her companion, played by Dan Birnbaum, she takes a taxi to her Aunt Ruth's apartment in Sunset Boulevard. After arriving at her Aunt Ruth's apartment and meeting with the manager, Coco, played by Ann Miller, Betty then notices a stranger occupying the apartment. The stranger does not remember who she is and how she got inside. She takes on the name Rita, played by Laura Haring, after seeing the movie poster of Gilda hanging on the wall. Afterwards, Betty calls her aunt and on the phone and asks her if she knows of someone named Rita. Her aunt responds by telling her that she does not. Betty then wants to know who she is and why she is at her aunt's apartment. Betty opens Rita's purse, and in her purse is a large sum of money, a blue box, and a key. Does Rita know how she got the key? If not, then who gave it to her, as well as where the large sum of money came from? Is there a connection between the two of them? It is a movie filled with twists and turns, a film that only exists between dreams and reality. What is real, and what isn't. So, what can I say about this film? As a beginner trying to understand the work of David Lynch, I thought that by watching this film, it would be a great exercise to watch it through one sitting. The one thing I noticed as I was watching this film was the theme of illusion and reality and dreams and reality. To explain my point, there is a scene in the film in which two men are at Winky's restaurant, which is a parody of Denny's, and Dan, played by Patrick Fischler, tells Herb, his best friend, played by Michael Cook, that he had a dream, and this is the second dream he had, in which Herb was standing right at the counter where the cash register is located, and he looks at the table that they are sitting at at this moment. He then leaves the register and goes outside, and he goes behind the Winkies restaurant. First, he spots a payphone, then he looks at the second door that points to the entrance, and finally he goes to the back of the restaurant, where he looks at a dumpster that's all covered in graffiti, and he sees a horrible looking face that comes from this wall. And after Dan describes the dream that he had, he decides to face his fear with Herb, his best friend, by doing the exact same thing that he just described to Herb and is later confronted with a homeless person with that same exact frightening face who may or may not be real. As the film starts to progress into different subplots that may somewhat be irrelevant to each other, It later ends up being central to the part of the film as the main plot of the film as it progresses. The darkness and the ambiguity of what is happening in the film, such as the mysterious Mr. Roke, played by David Lynch regular Michael J. Anderson, and what is his role in the film, or what is the mysterious actress named Camilla Rhodes, and why the director does not want her in this latest film project, and who is she? or why Betty halfway through the film suddenly has a romantic feeling towards Rita. So these are just some of the pure examples of the subplots that may or may not be coherent at the first viewing, 
but it does make sense if you watch it all together more than once. But what I could say is that Lynch's film is a critique of the Hollywood corporate culture within the studio system, while at the same time, despite not trying to be mean to Hollywood, he also tries to pay tribute to the nostalgic view of Hollywood. Otherwise, I thought it was a great mental exercise to watch this film during the first viewing and be able to understand what I could try to untangle from this extreme non-linear plot that David Lynch has served to this film and his viewers as a mental challenge, but also as an exercise in trying to lay out an incident that occurs with something that may seem similar, but also trying to convey it with complexities and somewhat irregularities. The film's journey began as a 90-minute television pilot for Touchstone Television for the ABC Network. Lynch pitched the idea to the executives at ABC, and his idea was greenlit. For the casting of the film, Lynch chose Naomi Watts and Laura Haring after seeing their photo resumes, but not by their previous work in film or television. Lynch met Justin Thoreau directly after his airplane flight and knew he was right for the role of the director in the film, Adam Thrasher. As Lynch was looking at the black clothing that Thoreau wore with his untidy hair that would be suitable for his character. Filming of the pilot began in February 1999 on location in Los Angeles and lasted for six weeks. Once the pilot was completed and finished filming, it was shown to the executives at the ABC television network. And the result was... Lynch's pilot was rejected. Among the network's objections were the nonlinear storyline, the ages of Haring and Watts, cigarette smoking by Ann Miller's character, and a close-cut shot of dog feces on screen in one sequence. Lynch described it thusly, quote, All I know is I loved making it. ABC hated it, and I don't like the cut I turned in. I agreed with ABC that the longer cut was too slow, but I was forced to butcher it because we had a deadline, and there wasn't time to finesse anything. It lost texture, big scenes, and storylines, and there were 300 tape copies of the bad version circulating around. Lots of people have seen it, which is embarrassing, because they're bad quality tapes too. I don't want to think about it. End quote. So Lynch ended up contacting Pierre Edelman, a close friend of his from Paris, to start talking about his latest project and to see if his pilot could be expanded into a feature film. Edelman went to the film studio Canal Plus in Paris and pitched the idea of expanding Lynch's rejected television pilot into a feature film, and also by giving Lynch the money to finish filming it. The negotiations took only a year. The script was later reworked from a television pilot into a feature film. Lynch described that journey thusly, quote, One night I sat down, the ideas came in, and it was a most beautiful experience. Everything was seen from a different angle. Now looking back, I see that the film always wanted to be this way. It just took that strange beginning to cause it to be what it is, end quote. The new material in the script included a love relationship between Rita and Betty and the scenes that happened after the blue box was opened. The new scenes were filmed in October 2000 with new funding from Studio Canal for $7 million. Some of the other actors who appear in the film are staples of Hollywood's nostalgia. Ann Miller, who plays the role of Coco, was a well-known Hollywood starlet who appeared in movie musicals during the 1940s and 1950s decade in such films as Easter Parade from 1948, On the Town from 1949, and Kiss Me Kate from 1953. Lee Grant, who plays Louise Bonner, started her Hollywood career in the film Detective Story from 1951, before she was blacklisted by the House of Un-American Activities Committee and did not return to the screen until the 1960s decade. She appeared in films such as In the Heat of the Night from 1967, The Landlord from 1970, winning an Academy Award for her performance in Shampoo, and later winning another Academy Award for directing the documentary feature Down and Out in America. And she recently appeared in Killian and the Comeback Kids from 2020 in a small role. Chad Everett, who plays the actor Jimmy Katz, is best known to soap opera fans as Dr. Joe Gannon in Medical Center, running from 1969 to 1976. For the small roles in the film, we have a few names that I won't get too much into. In the beginning of the film, Detective McKnight is Robert Forster, who appeared in a number of films such as Medium Cool from 1969, The Black Hole from 1979, Jackie Brown from 1997, and his final film appearance was in The Wolf of Snow Hollow from 2020. 
Wally Brown is James Karen, who appeared in films from The China Syndrome from 1979, Poltergeist from 1982, The Return of the Living Dead from 1985, Wall Street from 1987, and The Pursuit of Happiness from 2006. And in a few cameo roles are singers Billy Ray Cyrus and Rebecca Del Rio. The film premiered at the 2001 Cannes Film Festival on May 16, 2001, and earned positive reviews and acclaim. David Lynch won the Best Director Prize, whom we shared with Joel Cohen for his film, The Man Who Wasn't There, also in 2001, at the Cannes Film Festival. The film made its U.S. premiere at the Chicago International Film Festival and later at the New York Film Festival in October 2001. It premiered nationwide on October 19, 2001. The film earned positive reviews and was featured on a number of lists in some of the biggest film magazines and newspapers across the country and the world. At the 2002 Academy Awards, the film garnered only one nomination for Best Director David Lynch. However you want to interpret this film, I think of it as an open-ended film that has no right or wrong answers. It is more of the director's critique of the Hollywood culture system since its founding. A film that comments on dreams and nightmares, reality and illusions, success and failure. The film could be considered as a mixture of The Wizard of Oz and Sunset Boulevard because of its similarities. I have no easy answer to describe the meaning of this film or how to answer what really happened in the storyline, but I think of the film as a mental and well-developed exercise to challenge the film's viewers' perceptions of the plot and how it can turn the predictability around with new challenges. I recommend anyone who has heard of it or has never seen it to watch it for their first viewing and examine it very carefully on what the plot might be about. And if you have this film on DVD, pay particular attention to the clues left by the director to see if you can spot the clues and what they mean. We will be right back with Allow Me to Explain. Twitter shareholders approved the deal of allowing Elon Musk to take over the social media network, despite a Senate hearing on the whistleblower that would have set off the deal. So, what does this mean for users of Twitter, and how did we get to where we are at this moment? It's time for Allow Me to Explain. The Senate held a congressional hearing on Tuesday with the Twitter whistleblower Peter Zatko. He was the former security chief at Twitter. At the hearing, Zatko shared new details about his earlier allegations that some 50% of Twitter's over 7,000 employees could potentially access any user's personal information, including their address, phone number, and even their current physical location. The point of the hearing was to showcase about the concerns regarding security and privacy issues and the mishandling at Twitter. So I want to outline the few things about how did we get here, what is Musk's position on free speech, and what is the future outcome for Twitter. Well, let's start with the beginning of the timeline of how we got here. On March 26th of this year, Elon Musk contacted Jack Dorsey, founder of Twitter, to discuss the future direction of social media, including the benefits of open social protocols, according to the SEC filing. The next day, on March 27th, Musk told Twitter executives about the various options in consideration, including joining the Twitter board and how he purchased more than 5% of Twitter's stock. On April 4th, he announced that he bought a 9.2% stake in Twitter. On April 5th, the next day, Twitter submitted a filing before the SEC that would make Musk the director until 2024. On April 11th, the CEO of Twitter, Parag Agrawal, sent out a tweet that Musk would not be on the board of directors at Twitter. April 14th, Musk offers to buy Twitter, saying that he would pay $54.20 a share in cash or $43 billion. April 15th, the next day, Twitter in return enacted a poison pill that would stop Musk's takeover of the company. April 21st, Musk put out a federal security filing stating that he didn't have any equity partners for his Twitter takeover bid. Four days later, Twitter reversed and agreed to be acquired by Musk for $44 billion. Musk would pay $54.20 per share and would have been responsible for half of the financing. On May 10th, Elon Musk stated that he would reverse Twitter's ban of former President Trump. Four days later, on May 14th, Musk put out a tweet that his $44 billion deal to buy Twitter is temporarily on hold since he wants to know about Twitter's problems with their spam and fake accounts. May 16th, the CEO put out a statement on Twitter finding that less than 5% of its users are spam or fake accounts, while Musk responded with a poop emoji. 
May 17th, Musk said that his bid to buy Twitter cannot move forward because of his unanswered questions about the number of fake and spam accounts on the network. Twitter responded back with a statement that it planned to close the transaction and enforce the merger agreement between Musk and Twitter. May 27th, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission said that it was investigating Musk's early disclosure of the ownership stake in Twitter. June 3rd, Twitter told Musk that the U.S. antitrust waiting period for his deal had expired and that the purchase can move forward after approval from Twitter stockholders. June 6th, Musk had his lawyer send a letter to Twitter that he had a right to terminate the merger agreement and to also have Twitter provide information that will allow him to facilitate his evaluation of spam and fake accounts on the company's platform. Twitter agreed to give Musk access to their data on June 8th. June 16th, Musk met with the employees at Twitter at a town hall meeting that he wants the platform to be a safe haven for free speech, which is vague and does not offer assurances at the company. On July 8th, Musk tried to walk away from the $44 billion agreement by filing a letter to the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission that Twitter failed to meet its contractual obligations. July 12th, Twitter filed against Elon Musk as a way to force him to purchase the company which will now be heard before the Delaware Chancery Court, which will be heard on October 17th. So why is this a major concern for democracy in general? A number of human rights organizations have raised concern that should Elon Musk take over Twitter, it would open up a haven for hate speech on the platform and how he could make Twitter a private company instead of a public company for all. Musk has been known to be a critic of Twitter and its approach to the platform's free speech policies. When he was at a TED Talk on April 14th, he favored timeouts instead of bans. The reaction from the political spectrum was predictable. Since Republicans embraced the deal as a bellwether for free speech, Democrats, on the other hand, said that this deal would end up unleashing a flurry of misinformation and hate speech along with human rights activists on this same particular argument. Another major concern was that if Elon Musk took over Twitter, former President Trump would be back on the platform which was predictably true on May 10th. While Musk had said that he is a free speech absolutist, according to CNBC, when he was the leader of Tesla, he had his employees sign a separation agreement that included a non-disparagement clause with a no end date after the company had fired off its employees. His company has also a history of workers exhibiting alleged racist, sexist, and other types of harassment, discrimination, and unsafe working conditions. When it comes to journalists doing research on his business or himself, Musk has tried to control the narrative of how they should be reported. Musk and his company would ask reporters to sign NDAs or show story drafts to the company to obtain approvals before publishing. And on customers' free speech, one example of how Musk and his company unsuccessfully tried to silence their own customers' free speech was when Tesla used to compel customers to sign agreements containing non-disclosure clauses as a prerequisite to have their vehicles repaired. Another example is that Tesla did not want their customers sharing the info on their use of the FSD Beta, an experimental driver assistance software package of the Tesla, on Facebook, Instagram, Reddit, TikTok, Snapchat, and YouTube. And in the end, it was predictable that Musk's acquisition of Twitter was going to end poorly for him because of his erratic behavior and his lack of understanding about content moderation. And Elon Musk brought this on himself, and everyone around the spectrum, whether it was from human rights organizations, media watchdog groups, free speech advocates, and progressives and liberals, knew that it was going to end badly for him, and it was obvious. So the question now remains, what is going to happen now since the Twitter stockholders approve Musk's takeover of the company, and how can we hold big tech accountable? Well, the deal is not over with yet. The trial between Elon Musk and Twitter will start on October 17th and will last five days. On the other hand, Senator Klobuchar, who was at Tuesday's hearing, said that Congress has had dozens of hearings about the big tech regulation in the past several years ago, but it has not passed a single bill on this matter. Klobuchar and other senators have also called for more funding for the FTC to enable it to enforce penalties against Twitter and other big tech companies for this practice. So what you can do as a listener right now is to call on your senator and to let them know about the current situation regarding big tech and privacy issues, as well as what it would mean for democracy when it comes to misinformation 
and also on legislation to fund the FTC to enforce these penalties against big tech companies and their practices. This has been Allow Me to Explain. You have been listening to Film Talk with Jordan Ramirez. This series is now available to listen to on Anchor, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. It is also on my blog website, filmtalkwithjordanramirez.wordpress.com, with my latest podcast episode on the page labeled Episodes. You can contact me on my social media feeds such as LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I am also available on letterbox.com. If there is a film that you recommend that I would put for my next film review, make sure to submit it to my social media accounts. And until then, I'll see you at the movies. Thank you.